But that section's not boiling. Yeah. Oh, it is a little bit. Well, I guess start at the beginning. How do you identify a maple tree? It's a good start. So, maples, branches grow opposite. Mm. So if you have a limb, the branches will grow opposite. Now, there are limbs that will fall off or break off. So, but if you look for a bud or a nub, you'll be able to tell that they grow opposite. The only other tree that grows opposite that I know of is ash. Mm. Luckily, they're all dead, so you don't have to worry about misidentifying. Um, you can also tell by the leaves. Maple leaves are pretty um, identifiable. Um, so, if you find yourself... Okay. Um, maple trees, all maple trees you can tap. Even box elders. So, Manitoba maple, you can tap those. Oh. Um, silver maple... Red maple, sugar maple, black maple, you can tap them all. You can also tap black walnut, and you can tap birch, and you can tap other species. You can tap ironwood and hickory, but the sugar content is so low it's not even worth your time. Hmm. Um, birch has a ratio of 1 to 100, so to make a liter you need 100 liters. With walnut it's not the sugar content that's low, it's the sap that you get is low. So you need three times as many trees to produce the same, same amount of syrup. And then with sugar maples, your average sugar content is 2%, but these trees, I have found, they'll go up to 5%. What's um, the ratio for maple compared to, uh, you said birch was 1 to 100? Yeah, so maples at 2% is 1 to 43 um, and then as your sugar content goes up, your ratio goes up. So 5% is 1 to 17, which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if we go over here, this is a maple. You can see the holes that I've tapped in previous years. Uh, misconception is at the end of your season, should I plug? the hole or not. Don't plug the hole. Let the tree heal it naturally by itself. You can see where the tree has plugged up the hole itself. Um, and then, I think there was one on here that was a little split, but, so when you go to tap a tree, you kind of want to be, it depends on how tall you are, honestly. If you're shorter, maybe tap a little lower so you can get it off. I tap with three gallon pails and three gallons of full pail weighs quite a bit, so. <laughs> you don't want to lift up too high. Another option is drop lines. So a drop line is essentially just a tap with a hose that goes into a container. You can use a five gallon bucket, or you can use old Culligan jugs, really anything you can find. Um, what I use is a 5 16 Eco Spile and uh, they're pretty cheap if you buy them from the Mennonites, about 30 cents. Anyway, and then you just hang your bucket on top. There's a little hole on the side, you can put a wire through and you can put a lid on top, which is really good because you want to keep debris and sticks and leaves out of your sap. Unfortunately, you cannot prevent ants and moths from getting in. Uh, it's fine, it's good. <coughs> anyway, when you want to go tap a tree, this is a specific drill bit for tapping. You don't need to buy this, but this is nice to have. Um, so these two right here, you would you would want um, they're five sixteenths, but you'd want one one mil, or not half a mil less. So this is nineteen sixty fourths, just to have a smaller hole, so it's a bit of a tighter fit. Mm. So, to drill it in, you want to go at it at about a 10 degree incline. 10 degree incline. Oh, just, so it's kind of facing down a little bit. Yep, yeah, you just want it, you kind of want to go up a little bit, so that when this is in, it's hanging down just a slight bit. Not crazy amount, because if you go too far down, and you get all that weight in your bucket, it's going to pull itself out. Just a little bit down. But if you go too far up, you're going to have a little bit less sap coming out. 
Yes. Having it up, it yeah. wants to pull back in itself. Yeah, I won't want to run up. So, um, recommendations is don't tap when it's so super cold, because you're gonna have a you're gonna have more likely you're gonna have uh, your your whole split when it's cold. So tomorrow's supposed to be three or five degrees. Perfect time to tap. Um, tapping when to tap. So maple trees naturally the sap, the sap starts flowing in the early spring, late spring. Um, you're looking for below freezing at night and above freezing during the day. Um, you're always trying to look at the two week forecast. So if it's if you got a couple days that are below freezing in the forecast, but the majority of the days are above freezing, give her. Um, unless it's January, don't mm. give her. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're tapping on buckets or drop lines, you have about six weeks before the holes dry up. The bacteria will get into the hole and it'll just dry up. Um, vacuum lines will go longer. They've got... There's not much bacteria other than the initial drill. How, so, many, how many weeks does it usually, like, is the season? That really, that varies. Yeah. So, some years it was like three weeks and it was over. And some years it just almost never stopped. Last year I thought it was going to be a quick one and then it just froze up hard and it just extended the season. Last year for me was the best year ever. So, it lasted long enough that I didn't have enough wood to burn. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when you put buckets on, this is a tip for, for anyone that wants to put buckets on, you don't have to collect every day. Um, if you want to boil it right away, collect. But if you want to, say, boil on the weekends, collect a couple days a week and then store it for the weekend to boil. I always leave a little bit of sap in the pails especially if I know it's going to be windy, just so that they don't blow off. Having that little bit of weight is always a good thing. Um, let's see here. Is there anything else holding the pail into the tree besides the tap, or is it just hanging on the tap? The leverage. Um, I don't know, just because when it gets heavy, it's a lot to... to oh, tap. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> so, oh, there's another thing. You really only want to drill in an inch and a half deep. You don't want to go much deeper than that. Your spile is like an inch and a quarter, maybe. So just a little bit further. So you'll put that in there. You'll have it on here. And really it's just the bucket pulling back. You have a nice tight fit and it's holding it back. Okay. It's, uh, it blows my mind that they don't fall out because, you know, three gallons is... Super heavy. <laughs> well, it's almost 15 liters, which is, you know, 30 pounds. Yeah. But I very unless you unless you when you drill in you kind of gouge it a bit, it'll it'll pull out a lot easier. You want a quick in and out straight with no movement so that you have a nice tight fit. And then you'll just hit the top here with a hammer, either a plastic one or a small ball peen. Same with this, just on the maple on the, the side there. Um, these are all readily available from most sugar bush supply stores. I use Weber's Sugar Bush Supply in Heidelberg. Um, partially because he's a really nice guy and uh, he's Mennonite and he's cheap. <laughs> Storage. So sap will go bad if left in a warm spot. Anything under four degrees, so a, a fridge, fridge temperature, you want to keep it cold. Those barrels, I think, had olive oil in them. They took a lot of washing to get the olive oil smell out, but a little bit of elbow grease gets it done. Um, so yeah, so spoilage, you're, if your sap is clear, you're good. If it's a little opaque and it uh, still tastes good, you're still good to boil it. But as soon as it kind of goes a milky white, mm. you know it's gone. And if it tastes like bitter or kind of sappy, like when the trees are done their run, the sap will get like milky and sappy, sour tasting in your... Don't boil it. Oh. If you're planning on boiling your sap on the weekends, the best place to store it is on the north side of the, your building. Anything north facing. 
just to keep it out of the sun. Uh, if you have snow, kind of build up a bank and, and uh, cover your buckets in uh, snow. Um, I use five gallon pails. Uh, you can get them from wine shops or beer shops. Usually the wine stores will either sell them really cheap or give used um, uh, pails away. These came from Woodstock. They sell them for two bucks with nice. really good lids and they're food grade. Highly recommend using food grade things. Uh, this is my system. Like I said, you can't, my first year I used a turkey fryer. That was not efficient. Um, my second year, at the time, I was not married and I had lots of disposable income, so I bought this thing. Um, and then I purchased a flatbed 6x10 foot trailer and built the shack on top of the trailer. Um, I don't own trees. I do, but not enough to actually make this efficient. But, so I built it on a trailer so I could take it to the trees. Um, and it's definitely... Huh, it's, uh, it's a Frankenstein setup. Every year I usually put something new on or try to improve it somehow. My newest addition is this light. It's lovely. Um, so, boiling. Um, another easy way to do it is you can get a steel barrel and you can cut slots for buffet pans to put on top and then just seal them with either um, ceramic fire blanket or like a uh, gasket cord um, and then I would highly recommend lining the inside of it with fire bricks because you want to focus the heat on the bottom of your pan you don't want it to leach out or put sand in the bottom of it um, are you guys using wood? we're doing the turkey fryer done doing that so I'm going to switch to wood we have wood it's just too expensive with the cost of propane. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. So wood is my, I would highly recommend going with wood. Um, wood is cheap. If Skids, you can get skids anywhere and they're free most of the time. So I supplement my fire, my uh, my, uh, my hobby with, uh, with skid wood just because it's cheap. Um, but, uh, so boiling. Um, you want to get your sap to like syrup is seven degrees above the boiling point of water. Oh. Okay. Now I will do a disclaimer. When I did all the research for maple syrup, I was on American forums, so all my numbers are in gallons and imperial. <laughs> so I'm looking for 219 Fahrenheit and which is seven degrees above 212, which is boiling. Um, another way to check your density, though, is, do you guys use a hydrant? I haven't even used it yet, but I just bought one. So what I use, you can get two. There's, there's hydrometers and there's hydrotherms. A hydrometer is set, you want to use it at 207 degrees Celsius, which is what syrup is, and it's a den it's a buoyancy. So you'll put it in a cup with the syrup, and it'll have little ticks on here, which is your bricks. And a bricks is a measurement of soluble solids in a solution, usually sugar. So you can think of it as 66% um, sugar, 66 bricks. That's syrup. That's your cutoff. 66 to 68. Anything over 68, you're going to get crystals in your glass. Anything below 66, you got a higher chance of getting mold, especially if you don't seal your bottles correctly. Um, this is a hydrotherm. It's really handy because it's got a built-in thermometer in it. So you can use it at any temperature of syrup. So if your syrup is, I wouldn't use room temperature, but they say it was uh, below boiling. You could put it in there and you're looking for your mercury to hit level. So when it's in the syrup, let's just say this is your level syrup, and your the red line comes up level with um, the level. I have roughly what I'm boiling off. It's keeping my level correct. 
There is systems where you can put like a float, like your toilet float type deal to keep it always, always where you want it. Um, this is a continuous flow plan, pan. So some pans, like if you were to get a turkey, like a, a turkey fryer, or if you were to get steam pans and just do a batch boil, you would fill it up to here and you just boil it down, fill it up until you go through all your sap, and then you drain it off at the end of the night and then finish that small amount. For this pan, you put fresh sap in this side, and as you boil the water off, the, the fresh sap coming in is pushing the thicker sap around up until this point here. And once it hits this point here, the thermometer's just telling me the temperature. So for me, I'm looking for, you're looking for seven degrees above the point of boiling. So, and that depends on your, how high above sea level you are. Because the higher above sea level, the lower it takes to boil. So we're in Thamesford, we're a thousand feet above feet sea level. We, we can boil water, and it depends on the day too, it changes every day, but mm. usually about a, a degree below. But I'm for me, I'm aiming, because this is too inaccurate, it's hard to get a perfect syrup off this pan, because it's all kind of mixed in, but I'm looking for about 220 to 222. And the reason for that is, I cheat. I cheat at doing syrup. I don't pull off perfect syrup off the evaporator. I pull it off a little thicker, take it home, and I add distilled water back to bring the density to perfect. And I just find it's easier and just less of a headache for me. Mm. Now, um, what was I gonna say? Um, you could try to get it off at perfect, but I think it'd be too hard. Or just draw it off at 219, take it home, and finish it in a more controlled heat. Um, so for this system here, I usually do this. And also, because this is continuous flow, uh, a batch boil, you're going to keep adding sap and you're going to draw it off and finish it. See, you'd finish it on the stove at home. I would recommend... Finishing it on the stove at home is fine, but don't boil sap, raw sap, in your kitchen. Because you have so much water coming off of it. If you have wallpaper, you won't have wallpaper anymore. And it does have a bit of stickiness. And I assume mm. you guys probably... We've had our incidents. Yep, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Learn the hard way. <laughs> yeah, Learn the hard way. So, it does have a bit of a stickiness, so don't boil raw sap inside. But finishing syrup or almost syrup is fine because the amount of water coming off it is so much less. Um, so for this system here, it takes about 60 gallons of syrup to sweeten my pan. And by sweetening, sweetening my pan, I mean it takes about 60 gallons to get this sweet enough at this point here where I'm drawing syrup off. But once I hit 60 gallons, and depending on what sugar content is in the sap itself, I can draw off syrup every hour, hmm. consistently. So last year was a really good year with really high sugar content, and I was able to draw off 31 liters of syrup in 12 hours. That's a lot. It was a good day. A lot. It was a good day. Anyway, so this is what I use. This is a new addition to my system this year because they're not, they're, they're not cheap, but I found it cheap. And I use, sorry, I use this. And then I have a pre-filter in there and I'll just draw it off into there. And your, the pre-filter is just getting rid of all kind of the gunk in the sap, in the syrup. You know, bugs, ants, particles whatever, whatever I don't filter out when I, excuse me, collect my sap. Um, <clears throat> any questions about boiling? Is that pan sitting level? Yep. So, and the whole, one other question I have you too, so if the pan sitting level, there's holes in these um, separators. Yes. Yep. I'm guessing the, sep the hole in the separator, this separator is at that far end? Yep. So this one goes here, cuts. Okay back and okay. then around. Okay. So <coughs> for a continuous flow, 
it's paramount that your pan is level. If the pan is off a little bit this way, it'll take that much more sap boiled to get the finished product on this side and vice versa. So having with, with a batch boil, it doesn't matter because you're just boiling it all down. But with, with a continuous flow, if your pan isn't level, you're gonna have a headache. Um, <clears throat> you can use blowers. I use a blower. I just find it speeds my process up. Um, so I do use a blower. Uh, you don't have to. Um, What's a blower? Uh, Am I see that on switch it? behind her? This one here? Yeah, flick it. So there's a pipe right, right below you there. Oh, okay. It's a blower is just air. You're putting more air under the fire. So I have air under fire. Oh, and, and you just increase. You're just putting smoke. more air. More air is more, you know, oxygen. You want it to really, really give her. Um, it's actually the fire. There's not much firewood in there, so it's it's doing. You can see a noticeable difference. Oh, instantly. But for me. I fire the evaporator every seven minutes. Hmm. So I'm always putting more firewood in there. It's good to have a mixture of hardwood and softwood, but you don't need to, you can do it on both. But I, um, so every seven minutes you have lots of firewood in there, kind of crisscrossing everything. I try to keep my firewood small. So I try to keep it small, two to three inches in diameter, just so that you can get more airflow and more flames. You want flames. Um, in my system too, I have a kind of, it, it goes back to about here and then there's a ceramic fire blanket that goes up and then down, leaving about an inch between the pan and the fire blanket. Goes down, goes a little bit, and then up and then down again. And my research has shown that from the University of Vermont, it creates almost like a, uh, a reburn, like in a high efficiency stove, wood stove. It'll reburn some of the gases that haven't ignited and then it'll go out. And that just gives a quicker boil, a hotter fire, and it's actually a little bit more efficient. Less smoke. Less, oh, when this thing's really going, there's no smoke. No smoke. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's... Burns everything. Oh yeah, it's it's really good. Um, don't mind my really decrepit snap. If you're gonna get a snap a stack, get stainless steel. Um, materials, I would highly recommend stainless steel. It's easier to clean. It's just better. It's gonna last longer. Uh, the buffet pans are really good for uh, backyard maple syrup. Um, you can put it on a barbecue. Barbecue is better. It's gonna contain that heat. Uh, versus putting it just on a turkey fryer, you're going to lose a lot of your heat, especially on a windy day. Um, <clears throat> boiling. Any questions? What gauge of stainless steel is that? I think it's 22. Okay. I'm planning on a custom can made this coming week, so I'm just. I think it's 22, maybe 24. What does it say? It doesn't seem like okay. But I did purchase this one. As I had disposable income. You would have it. Sorry. Hmm? How much does that cost? It was two grand. So. Uh, Eighteen hundred, but that's probably more now. Yeah. You would highly recommend about those the dividers into it though for the flow like that. So just if you're building a pan this size, well, it'll be about half the size. I mean, probably it'll be about eighteen by twenty-four. I guess. Okay. That leaves me. Okay. Do you have time to babysit it? Not really. So with continuous flow, once you have it um, sweetened, you're going to draw off quite a bit. Potentially going to draw off. If you just do a flat pan without the dividers, then it's a batch boil. I would make the side taller. I'd make them like 10 inches. So one thing I wish I had was higher sides. Because when you get to the point where you're getting really close to syrup, it's bubbling like crazy. And for me, I've had it overflow. It was bubbling so bad. So... This stuff here is not bubbles. This stuff here is just minerals and um, know, what's the word? contaminants in the sap, just oh. boiling out. I scrape it off just because it impedes my boil. Um, 
Would you say that if you had a pan with 10 inch sides, you still have the, the dividers in it? Yep. Then you would essentially you could do you could boil it this way, or it would also allow you to do a batch boiling yep. it too. Then. You, I could batch boil in this. Okay. I would just fill it up to here and just boil it. Well, I wouldn't even fill so it up to there. You would just be concerned about potentially boiling over. Boiling over. over. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I run my pan at between one inch and a, yeah, about one inch deep. Okay. I run at an inch deep just because there's less energy to boil it and you're gonna get a really good boil. You can boil, sometimes I get lazy and I get you know, distracted and it gets up to like two inches and then I have to spend all that time working it down to an inch again. Um, but uh, what I do use if it gets really foamy because it'll bubble up like crazy, say a couple degrees before it even hits syrup. And if it bubbles up like crazy at an inch deep, there's really not a lot of actual liquid to draw off. So what I do is, nobody here is a vegan. Good. I use butter. <laughs> I use butter to kill my, uh, to, to dissipate. It's a fat. A fat dissipates the bubbles. You can use a strip of bacon, or you can buy commercial deformers, but why would you buy one when you just use butter? <laughs> or bacon, or yeah. sausage, or something. Um, let's see here. Huh? Some lard. Yeah, lard works. Exactly. It's, it's just fat. Um, so filtering. So you, would you just put that like on the end here? Or? Yeah, I usually, usually this is the, this is kind of the, the syrup partition. Yeah. This is the one that really goes. But if I'm, and I, I'm, if I'm on the ball, which sometimes I'm on the ball, if I'm on the ball, both crazy. of these will be going crazy. It's crazy the different colors already. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, there's... Sorry, go ahead. Um, no, how, go ahead. How long at a stretch do you, would you uh, have this running? Like you mentioned that you uh, fire it every seven minutes, so I'm guessing that's not 48 hours in a row. No, no, no. Um, I I will usually boil for eight hours at a time. Uh, sometimes it'll go for 16 hours, depending on how busy I am. Um, there's been years where I've been just I've had enough sap to fill a swimming pool. So if I don't boil it, it's going to be on the ground. So. Um, and I do have lots of help. Um, I have some retired friends that help me out. I'm always looking for more help. <laughs> and if it's not done by that, say, eight, uh, I will leave 12 it. hours, can you let it rest yes. for a while? So if you don't get it boiled, like you'll probably still pull off syrup if you've already gotten your pan sweetened. If you don't have it sweetened, you probably won't draw anything off, but you can leave it. So if it's, say, like tonight's go, it's going to be below freezing tonight. Just leave it. I cover the pan, so I keep mice out. They're a pain in the butt. I cover it just with that, and I weigh it down so nothing can get in it. And I've had that problem before. Oh man, I had to dump 27 liters of almost syrup. I fed it to the cows. <laughs> they can give you more butter. Yeah, exactly. More sugar. But yeah, uh, you can leave it, and then you'll come back the next day because it's not not water anymore. It's it's got sugar in it. It won't freeze solid. It'll be kind of that slushy slushy con texture, and then you just put a fire in it, and it'll you can start back up. Hmm. I've left it for a week straight without boiling. If it's like a really hard freeze up, and you know it's going to be a hard freeze up, and the trees aren't going to run, then I usually just dump it, clean the pan, and fill it back up when the next run comes. <laughs> um, when finishing, we went over this, but when finishing, it's if you don't get this, then you boil water first to see what it's boiling at, and then add seven degrees, and then you're, you, you should be at syrup. That could change, but you should be at syrup. Um, and then bottle filtering. So behind you there on the wall, there's two examples of the filters I use. There's the big cotton filter, and then there's a pre-filter inside. Awesome. So this year, from what I hear, uh, the sugar sand is quite high. Um, and sugar sand is, it's, it's hard to explain, it's sand. It's sand, like I had it one year, I dug out of my filters and it was literally sand in my hands. 
And that's out of the tree? It's out of the sap. Oh. Yeah. And it uh, it doesn't taste sweet, it tastes like sand. <laughs> I was gonna say, it's oh, I've tried it. I'm gonna say, it's <laughs> it tastes like too. sand <laughs> and it uh, it plugs up your filters. Oh. And I hate filtering. It's my least favorite part of this whole thing. Takes forever, right? Oh, it's a pain. <laughs> so what I do is I usually use three or four pre-filters within my big cone filter, and as they plug up, I pull them out, and then I just keep pouring it in. Um, I yep. It's good to pre-wet it. The filter, it'll run easier. It's you don't want to filter when your syrup is hotter than 190 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll have to do little subtitles for what that is in Celsius because I don't even know. 190 degrees Fahrenheit because anything above 190, knitter will form. So, um, what's a knitter? Knitter. Knitter is the sand. Oh, okay. Is the sand. Um, so I filter it, I try to filter it below 190 degrees because if I don't, then I'm going to have to filter it again. Um, I filter it into a coffee urn. So behind you, you'll see there's a coffee, an older coffee urn. Oh, there's a bigger one than that. But. And that's how I bottle. So I'll put it in the urn. The best thing about urns are, they keep your coffee at 185. And that's perfect for bottling. So I just put it in there, keeps it at 185 degrees, and then you can use the spout to bottle right off of it. So, um, on a budget, you can reuse the PC maple syrup bottles. They've kind of got that flip top. The flip top with the seal on there. Um, I'll be honest, I've never used them, but I know you can. I just use mason jars. Um, you can use mason jars. Uh, it's the same concept as canning. You're literally just putting it in hot, putting the seal top on, and then laying it on its side five minutes. Um, you can um, you can you can reuse some of the glass bottles that you buy. You just buy new caps. I would always buy new caps. Uh, they come with the sealing paper in the top and then you just screw them on tight and put them on their side. Um, Why do you store them on their side? It creates the seal. Yeah. It's, it's really to create the seal. Versus uh, upside down? You can do upside down too. Yep. Mason jars you can do upside down. Yeah, it's safe space. If you had leftover maple water just coming out of the tree, could you just drink that straight too? Oh, that's a great point. So this tree right here, it I put two taps on it. One tap is for syrup, one tap is for me. I drink from one tap a year, and it usually produces about 10 gallons of sap. And that's what I drink when I'm out here by myself. Um, I will do a disclaimer. Um, apparently, I found out this a year or two ago, that sap is a natural laxative. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to work on me, so I keep drinking. <laughs> or maybe you need it. <laughs> or maybe I need it. There's no bathroom out here, so I try not to. <laughs> How long would it stay good for if we kept it in the fridge? So it'll stay good for quite a while. Water. You want to keep the sap under 4 degrees. So as soon as it goes above four degrees, the bacteria is just going to start eating away at the, uh, the sugar. And that's another thing, your, you, your season, the beginning of your season usually is light because there's less bacteria. As the season progresses, the, the grade and the color changes. They so sell it in stores sometimes. The different grades? No, no, like the sap, you just buy like birch sap or maple sap. Come on over, I'll supply you with free stuff. <laughs> or just tap a tree. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much cheaper. Um, and fresher, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, fresh sap is its great to drink. I know some people will say, oh, you should boil it first. Don't do that. <laughs> I, when would you good for you. cut off time from taking, drawing the sap from the trees? Cut off time? Yeah. Um, when the sap starts to taste buddy and sour then you know it's, and it's not like that clear, crisp, clear color. As soon as it turns kind of almost milky and buddy, that's that's when your cutoff point is. Sometimes you'll have your taps in, usually if you drill it in and you hang buckets, you're, 
the holes will dry up at around six weeks. So that's kind of the cutoff point. Um, so you would never drill two holes? Like a, drill another hole for the same tree in the same season? I don't. I don't because I don't own my trees. Okay. So I want to take care of the trees here because they graciously let me tap them. So I, I'm very conservative. So um, rule of thumb is anything, I think it's 10 to 12 inches. Anything 10 to 12 inches, you can put one tap. 18 inches, two taps, and anything over 27 inches, three taps. I don't do three taps, I just do two. Just because for me, I've been in this, I've been at Maple Grove for six seasons, and there's quite a few taps around the trees at this point. And I try to tap six inches away from the previous season's tap, just to give it time to heal. Um, this year I will be tapping within that six years. Uh, I don't know if you can on this one as much, but like it kind of bulges out there. Okay. Uh, this here, where yeah. it comes out like that, yeah. like right in here. It's like right there. Sugar it's almost like a highway of sap right there. And um, I don't know, I haven't actually put a hole in there yet. Crazy. Mm, good spot. <laughs> yeah. But the size of the crown really affects your sugar content. Because like in a bush, all the trees are fighting for sunlight, so their crowns are quite small. But with these sugars, they're quite mature and they got huge crowns on them. And, uh, and these trees here at Maple Grove, I've tested them, and they're between, usually between three and 5%, usually. So you want bigger crowns? For, I want bigger crowns, and you want to you want a mature and healthy tree. So if I like in when I'm tapping, if I spot like major damage or or, or uh, branches starting to die off, I tend not to tap it because eventually they'll just chop chop it down and I'll burn it some point later on. Um, let's see here. I do have. Do you guys have a refractometer? No. Have you ever used one? All right, so this is refractometer. You can, they're common in beer making to, to um, calculate alcohol. But what you do is you take a little bit of water and you put it on the glass and then you has a dial when you look into it and you just calibrate it to zero with water. And then you'll take a little bit of sap and put it on there. And then when you look at it, you should be able to see how much sugar content you have in the sap. So when you look at it into the light, the left hand side has brick percentage and the other side has alcohol, but the bricks percentage, it goes from zero to 40 on this one. And usually I'll be able to calculate in the beginning of the season, the sugar content's a little lower. And as the season progresses, the sugar content usually goes up and then by the end it goes down again. So, you want to look in there you can see you can see the which one was it I always I always chuck my ice okay look. oh that's just always telling me that that can that's another way to get less water or more I water out of the sap always I have uh, tested it tested the ice from the sap like if your sap freezes up solid keep it like if it freezes up solid but this didn't freeze up solid, it still had liquid. So I have taken ice like this, melted it down, and used a refractometer, and it was like 0.2% sugar. Okay. Which is not enough to bother, like I'm not gonna waste my, my time in firewood trying to boil off that little amount of sugar. But I have had it where I've taken sap, it's frozen, I've poured off the liquid into another container, froze again and poured it off again and I've gone from 2% to 9%. Okay. So that really cuts down on your boiling. Um, is that why the ice is freezing more up top because the, the sugar is heavier it, and it's settling more? It or? freezes on the top but it also freezes on, on the, the sides. Side. Same with this one. Like it was pouring here and it, 
Okay. Freezes on the top and sides. So you would just chuck that? I would chuck it. Yep. Because the sugar content is so low. It's the sugar content's low, and essentially you're just you're just concentrating it. So for me, I'll use a screwdriver. So if it freezes in the buckets on the trees, I'll just take a screwdriver, jam a hole, pull it out, and chuck it. Just because I don't have some, I know it's a huge debate. Well, the debate is chuck it or boil it. It's only the water that freezes. That's the whole point of ice wine. You wait for the grapes to freeze and uh, squeeze them out while they're still frozen. There you go. Yeah, so uh, I... So it's super concentrated. I chuck it. There's no point. Okay. And it's a great way, especially if you know it's going to be cold, it's a great way to reduce your boiling and to con concentrate your sap yeah. without having to do anything. Yeah. The sap goes up, and during That's the day the sap goes feature. down. So you're thinking, well, how does that make sense? The pressure inside the tree is different than the pressure outside of the tree. So how I explained it to little kids, take a water balloon and poke it with a pin. What happens? It pushes it out. Same with that. You tap it, it's pushing the sap, the sap is coming, coming out. Doesn't matter if it's coming out like this or this, it's gonna come out. So, well these, the drop lines are actually, you'd think it would make more sense. It's just open on the end. Right. So even yeah. then, if it was coming like this, how's it coming mm -hmm. out? But yeah, it's, it's literally, and that's also another good reason why you're wanting to tap it a little bit longer than your spile. So it kind of just goes in. But cool. anyway, mm -hmm. it um, it's kind of weird how it works. Cool. God makes it uh, <laughs> work. <laughs> um, the lids are like... Put that in there. There. You put it in your tree and your lid keeps any debris, bark, leaves out of your sap, less filtering. I usually do, I use um, my initial one, I'll just put this got a nice hook on it. I'll just put it on the side like that and I'll just pour the sap in. It filters out any twigs and bugs that get in the sap and then from there it just goes straight into the evaporator and then use that again to filter it into the, the milk tank. And I think I got these at, I don't know, somewhere. Dollar store. Oh, have that in my pocket. I bought um, something new this year actually for cleaning and it works. It's going to work great. Actually it worked last year too. I bought a bottle brush that hooks onto a drill. And that's what I use to clean my buckets or my pails. So cleaning, I use, I use an alkaline cleaner detergent because it takes the sugar off really easy. Um, for the pan, vinegar works really good. If you're on top of it every year, vinegar is good enough to clean off any mil mineral buildup. You just want that acid. Um, yeah, you really just uh, clean your clean your buckets and store them for the year. I always pre-wash before I start the season, just because a year a year in a shed has a tendency to build up stuff that you don't want to, you know, cobwebs and stuff. Yeah. Um, what else? For me, the biggest thing for you if you get a pan is to cover it. If you, like if you don't drain it at the end of the night and you just leave it there for the next boil, cover it. <laughs> Never again. Flower. <laughs> if anyone wants to borrow it. Yeah, I would look at home too. <laughs> have at her. It's got a glowing testimonial. <laughs> <laughs> don't use this, use a drill. It's just better. Um, let's see. <laughs> <laughs>